Welcome back to Seek Strength and welcome back to the Seekistan new show. My name is Owen and today we'll be doing the new show solo. Dara needs just a little bit of a break. Today's new show is of course brought to you by the Seek Strength app on iOS and Android. For our weightlifters, because our weightlifters are first up, check out the new upper body body armor program. The first block of that is out. It is shorter, hypertrophy focused upper body sessions to couple with your weightlifting mainstream program. Now first up, I feel it's apt that we talk about upper body bodybuilding because we have got some genuine, more unseen, secret footage of Louis Aujun. I secretly kept this away from there last week when he was doing the new show because I wanted it all for myself. You know I love Louis Aujun. You know I love old school training footage. Unfortunately, this is somewhat old school 2015. Fuck, it's nine years ago. This is the two preceding attempts before Luz Aujun's best ever snatch of 180 kilos, which we've all seen, but there's a 175 kilo snatch and a 177 kilo snatch when he was a 77 kilo weightlifter. My goodness. My goodness. Everyone just watch the screen for a second. We're just going to look at the 180. Oh my goodness. It's basically the same lift. He just gets a little bit deeper. It's a little bit heavier at the bottom of the 180. Look at the shin angles, barbell moving back, his back position, shoulders are over the barbell. These are super back at the knee position, super straight extension, really close. Fuck. Let's watch it one more time. Okay, everyone just watch this for three hours. Just Let's just sit here for a few more minutes. I just, fuck yeah, what a video. So happy to see this. My precious. That's why Dara didn't get it because he just wouldn't appreciate this as much as I would. 177 kilos such good use of that upper body and he's just an absolute horse amazing i hope you enjoy that footage as much as i do that was coming from cart album monica marash is lining up for the iwf junior world so we've got the iwf junior worlds underway at the moment and it's great to see so many young lifters competing if you don't know what a junior is in weightlifting it's the year you turn 20 is your last year to compete as a junior which is different from other sports like powerlifting where a junior is actually 23 years old monica is a polish lifter and she put this last hard training session up on her instagram where she did a very very easy 95 kilo snatch 115 kilo clean and jerk and 140 kilo back squat she is coming back from a quad tear earlier this year at Europeans, which was at a very unfortunate time coming up to the Olympics. She's, of course, still very young, so she's several more Olympic attempts in her. And considering how good a weightlifting nation Poland is, she likely has some very good support and coaching behind her. So it'll be very interesting to see what she ends up hitting at this competition. These lifts look very, very crisp, and she's come a long way from recovering from a quad tear, which is pretty uncommon in terms of weightlifting so it'll be really interesting to see what she ends up hitting at this competition pan yun wa the up-and-coming 89 kilo lifter from china showed us this what i believe to be a 215 kilo clean so in his story he had a 210 kilo clean and there seems to be i think there are two and a half kilo plates added on top of this so it looks to be a 215 kilo clean he is still a teenager i think he might be 18 years old now currently he's exceptionally strong a little bit, just a little bit rough around the edges in terms of technique, but that's definitely something that will tidy up, I believe, as he gets older. You know, if we looked at Tian Tao when he was 17, 18, he'd quite a similar technique to Pan here, actually, which is quite interesting. And obviously then we saw Tian Tao develop into an extremely good technical model, except for the squat jerk. This was a missed clean and jerk attempt for Pan, so he went for that squat jerk, but he did not make it. I'm not exactly sure what his best clean and jerk is, or well... We have the heavy clean jerks on his YouTube or on his Instagram, but we don't actually know what his best lifts are. He's a long way to develop, so it'll be very interesting to see what his future is on the Chinese national weightlifting team. Now here we've got an interesting one from the IWF Junior Worlds currently underway, and this is Mohammed Al Marzouk, and he is competing for Saudi Arabia, which is very interesting, and he set his three new youth world records. So youth in weightlifting is... The year you turn 17 is the last year you were a youth. He snatched 144 kilos and he clean and jerked 166 kilos. So this is very, very, very interesting. And a really exciting future for the sport to see younger lifters setting youth world records because it's a sign of good things to come or the potential for good things to come. Notably, you're probably thinking Saudi Arabia is quite interesting, but we had 
Ritvar's coach, Edwards, from Latvia. He was spending some time with the Saudi Arabian team last year. I'm not sure if he's still involved. I haven't seen anything. I know Edwards was involved with the IWF coaching scheme where they were doing IWF level one style coaching or they were trialing it. Dara actually did the course a couple of years ago. He said it was quite interesting where they were trying to get international coaches to do some of that coaching certificate and Edwards was hosting youth training camps in Latvia for younger lifters. One of our lifters went over so he I assume was also helping out Saudi Arabia training there and Red Fires was also training with him last year sometime. The Korean stallion Yang Jae, a super heavyweight from the Republic of South Korea. He is a thick boy and he's going for his 300 kilos for a 3 rep max. Bastard. So, first two reps, easy peasy, but he was shifting back onto his heels just a little bit too much, and he almost fell over walking backwards with 300 kilos, but Yang Jie is, of course, a unit, and that did not stop him making that third attempt. The South Korean squat model is quite interesting. They aim for a really consistent movement between the hips and the knees going forward, so if we might watch traditional weightlifters squatting, you'll see them almost always exclusively pushing their knees forward, sitting those hips in on the bottom, but the South Korean style of squatting is something a lot of their weightlifters adhere to. And it's a little bit more ass, a little bit more glute dominant involved in the squat. So we have this even distribution between the knees moving forward and the hips moving back. It definitely produces some big squatters. It would have an interesting transference to weightlifting. And they all squat really consistently like this. And the really interesting thing as well is that when they're hitting those heavy weights... Their technique stays fairly consistent. Now, that's not to say all strong squatters in South Korea squat like that, but it is a notable model that a lot of their lifters adhere to. So it is really interesting. Try to take note of that for different lifters from South Korea when they're squatting. If they, for Yang Jie or those lighter lifters, you'll see some of them will adhere to this, but others then will sit to that more traditional model where they'll really sit their hips in at the bottom and look for exclusive knee travel forward. Now here we've got some OG footage again. So this is 2019, so not so long ago, pre-bad times are where everyone time warped. But this is from Larior, and this is peak Xijiang. This is a 168 kilo snatch in the Maui training hall. One of the cooler training halls, one of the more old school ones. It's not the same huge national one that we normally see them training that we would have seen Lu in recently. So this 160 kilo snatch, as you can see even by the physique of Xijiang, is insane. This is so sub-maximal. This is a really good example of just why Xijiang is and well was one of the greatest weightlifters now whether he has retired is something that we don't particularly know yet i hope he isn't i know his back injury was really really bad you may remember dr steph performance he's one of the physios for chinese national team was on the podcast last year and dr steph was telling me pre-olympics that the back injury was really bad the injuries he was dealing with were very very intense so what i'm kind of hoping for is that he gets those sorted and could make a comeback because we saw the light and he snatched. We saw that 165 kilo snatch in Paris and it was so easy. I can't show it to you because it'll get taken down off YouTube. But look at this 165, look at this 168 and they're basically super easy. They're basically the same thing. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping Xi Jiang has a comeback in him and maybe one more Olympics because... I feel like we never got to see Xi Jiang's full potential because he was never really pushed and then he got injured and then we didn't really see the same level of Xi Jiang who was being pushed, who was power cleaning 190 in competition as opposed to the Xi Jiang we got with a back injury. I want to see this Xi Jiang come back and show us some bigger numbers. Now, here is a very interesting one and a very pleasant one, in my opinion. We've got Roslyn Nuruddinov competing at the Uzbek Nationals recently. He competed as a super heavyweight, but I assume he just weighed in a little bit heavier than 109 and didn't cut for the weight class. He snatched 191 kilos and clean and jerked a very sharp 230 kilos. Now, Roslyn, I assume, is really making a beeline for Bahrain later this year for Worlds. And this 230... To me, this looked as good as any clean and jerk he's ever done before in the past, these 230s. Obviously, we had Ruslan really peak for that 2014 105 kilo world where he was battling Ilya Elian, David Bazanian in that 105 kilo class. 
and Rosin is the last of those three currently still competing on the international platform. David still seems to be training somewhat. He had a video of him benching 200 kilos the other day, which was a bit random, but he was a fantastic lifter. Obviously, you know what happened to Alien since, but Rosalind has been battling and training diligently since. So I'm very, very excited to see this. Now, we can have a quick look at that 191, but unfortunately, the only videos I'm getting are slow motion videos. And I'll tell you a little secret, I actually don't really like watching weightlifting in slow motion. Unless I'm looking for a very particular technical aspect, watching the lift in slow motion just doesn't really do it for me. The only video I like watching in slow motion is Hook Rip put up Ilya Ilian in super slow-mo in Grozny where he did that 246 and it's a thing of beauty. But very pleased to see Roslyn hitting these big numbers again and hopefully there's a lot more to come in this training block. Lastly, we've got Kianush Rastami returning to the international platform and he will be competing for Kosovo and not for Iran. So we know Kianush always had his issues with the Iranian Federation. We know he had some issues with the coaching. We had some issues with the finances. Now, who was at fault here? We'll never really know. Or rather, someone knows, but they probably won't tell us if, if they're out there. Who was at fault? Who was the issue? I don't particularly know. But what we do know is Kianush had a big falling out with them and he is set to return for Kosovo, which is quite interesting. I'd be interested to know how that setup happened politically, how those connections were made. Kianush is obviously a fantastic lifter. He seems to be in somewhat okay shape here. This 150 kilo snatch doesn't really tell us a whole lot. I assume he's returning to shape. We've seen him return to shape quite quickly before. We know he's done some massive lifts, most notably his 220 kilo clean and jerk in the Fajir Cup. For the 85 kilo world record, we know he's got the Olympic gold from Rio as an 85 kilo lifter. So Kianush is obviously a incredibly high level lifter. So I wouldn't be counting out anything here. What kind of support he'll get from Kosovo, how that'll play out in his training block is all to be seen. So it'll be interesting to see what happens in Worlds this year in Bahrain. And this is Dr. Plate, so I don't actually know his name. So if anyone does know Dr. Plate's name, I'd be very interesting to see. It's just Dr. Plate's on Instagram. But what I do know is that he has a beautiful squat. This is a 292 and a half junior squat. He's 18 years old, and he was weighed in at 101 kilos. And let's just watch this 292 and a half kilos high bar squat. He's got the Nike Savaleos on, which I never actually tried, but by all accounts were a terrible shoe. But had a lower heel, which actually would be quite useful for a lot of people in weightlifting. Because when you're trying to hit depth at parallel, that higher heel can actually skew that hip crease going down a little bit if you're squatting very, very high bar, like we're doing here. So kudos to Dr. Plates. But the squat itself is very, very nice. Nice wide stance, toe slower and slightly out. Again, high bar is quite interesting. And we've been talking about that a lot recently about the difference between high bar and low bar and the trade off for powerlifting. But you can see this super upright torso, really quad dominant, and definitely a lot more there. He said, Give me the 300, which I'm sure is there. Mary Telly squatting 291 kilos. This was a 15 kilo comp PR. She benched 125 kilos, which is a 5 kilo PB, or at least in her competition. And then she dealt off the 257 kilos, which was 10 kilos. And she, she set a national record briefly. So she's competing in the 84 plus kilo class. But the lift, of course, that I want to really zone in on here is that 291 kilo squat. The number of lifters we're seeing squatting plus 270 in female raw powerlifting or raw at wraps is absolutely massive. And it was only a matter of time before we were going to see some of those huge squats. You know, we've seen some big squats in equipped powerlifting before. But they were someone breaking that raw barrier. You know, I think the heaviest we've seen so far is 310.5 kilos. But to see these kind of routine 290 plus, maybe more 300 kilo plus squats, there's probably some 300 kilo squat there for Mary in her training. So it's really interesting to see the evolution on the female side of powerlifting, which is getting exceptionally popular as powerlifting is in general. So it's really interesting to see where that squat side of things will end up. The deadlift is obviously being pushed very heavy as well. We haven't seen the same huge pushes in the upper body pressing and the bench across any of those weight classes just yet. But it will be interesting what will happen with that raw bench press. But for Mary here, this 291 kilo squat is gargantuan. So let's watch it one more time before we move on. So she's in the Vans, the classic. A, listen, they're a comfy shoe, but 291 kilos, so she's in the sleeves. Very 
very good depth here absolutely no doubt about it from my point of view and nice consistent stand-up so i think that 300 kilo plus is there graham hicks is squatting 340 kilos for a safety bar front squat now this is outrageous this is possibly one of the heaviest front squat we've seen on camera this looks so easy here. This looks like he could add 20 or 30 kilos to that. Obviously, with the safety bar squat, it's a little bit more dangerous to bail on a heavy front squat. But Graham absolutely buries these. Graham is a strong man, and he is really putting the strong and strong man here with this 340 kilos front squat. You'll see a lot of the powerlifters and strong men will favor this style of front squat. They will favor this with a regular bar, or they'll use this kind of cross grip or this bodybuilding style grip with the safety squat. The only issue with loading that and setting it up can be quite difficult depending on your setup. So it can be a little bit tricky. And then there's a potential for some maybe egregious injury if you're bailing it incorrectly with a safety squat bar metal plates and then the handles on the safety squat so you better be sure how strong you are and Graham I'm sure he's pretty strong I'm pretty sure he's confident how strong he is so you can see the depth in this is very very legit and the speed on the way up is massive we've got our boy Andrew Kyle Tang at it again with that high bar deep squat and he squatted 606 pounds for a set of six, which is 275 kilos. As you know, Andrew is one of the growing number of powerlifters who seem to favor the high bar, whether that's for ethical reasons or for tactical powerlifting reasons, we don't know, but we're a big fan of it when we see it. And Kyle is squatting this 275 for a set of six. So he recently squatted the big 320 which is a gargantuan number for high bar squatters, especially when you're squatting to essentially full depth like Kyle is here. So he's bottoming him out. His hamstrings and his dump truck are touching those calves. So this is absolutely great to see. Kyle is making some big moves on his squat in particular. And we're really interested to see where it goes beyond that 320 kilos. So shout out to Kyle here for this beautiful high bar squat. Jessica Bittner competed at the CPU Nationals recently. So she didn't have high expectations, but she said she's very happy with the results. She squatted 216 kilos, which is a huge squat, of course. And she dead off the 250 with a 105 kilo bench press. So just take a quick look at the squat here. Jessica Bittner's squat is very, very strong. She's a very dominant quad She's a very quad dominant low bar squatter. Really interesting thing about this is just the head position. So you can see she starts with this somewhat neutral head and then keeps it pretty neutral as she squats throughout the lift. Now the head position is something very, very important that you should be taking note of, whether you're high bar squatting, low bar squatting, or anything in between in this position can massively affect the position of your back, the position of the barbell. So for example, in the high bar squat, we're almost always going to be wanting looking up, especially on the ascent. So as we're standing up out of the high bar squat, we're going to be wanting that chin up and probably lifting the chin even a little bit higher to make sure we're still hitting as much thoracic and upper back extension as we can possibly get. But that upper back extension may not always be the best thing we're looking for in the low bar squat. So it's definitely something that I want you to look and play around with, no pun intended, on the look. So if that extension hit too much of an arch on the low bar squat, there's a possibility that we could lose that barbell's position. It might shift down our back. We might lose it fully, but we can definitely throw it off in that position a little bit. So watching where your head position is on the low bar is very useful. Then, of course, Jessica is a, an exceptional dead of their conventional always, toe straight ahead, and this mixed grip style lifting. Nice aggressive dynamic start, which is very, very common for her. And it's a really good way of deadlifting. It's probably something you should look into as well if you're not using that dynamic start. And you want a stronger start from the floor. Looking at the dynamic start. The use of dynamic start is incredibly useful. And then the 105 kilo bench press is... It's a harsh pause command on that particular bench press. The the differences in the, the length of time you're you can be forced to pause is all to play for when there's an extra half or one second there. There's some argument to be made for removing the pause on the bench press rule. So there were some changes in the IPF last year in terms of how wide we could grip the barbell or how wide lifters could grip the barbell. I think it would be interesting to see a federation playing around with the lack of a pause on a bench press as you know we don't see them having to pause at the bottom of a squat for example so i'm not sure why we're expected to see lifters pause at the bottom of the bench press other than it's a done thing if there's a better reason i'm open to hearing for it now next up we've got the little debacle in the ipf 
you know we don't stray into the governance issues too frequently across different sports usually we'll just rag on the international weightlifting federation but today is the international powerlifting federation's turn recently they had a coaching course and a slide of that was released to the public now this is in relation to coaching female lifters it says be careful with her emotions give her special motivation Mostly females have very high level responsibility, so don't tell her the accurate planned weights for the training. Win her trust. <laughs> okay, you can't, you can't make that up. So obviously, people were like, "WTF is going on here?" So this is the IPF's apology. I'll read it in full because it's worth listening to it. Statement from the IPF Executive Committee. Initially, the IPF would like to offer its apologies to its members, especially its female members, who might have been impacted by a slide taken from an IPF training course, which has been widely shared on social media. It's important to note that the slide is being misconstrued and does not reflect the IPF's viewpoint in coaching female athletes. The slide has been taken out of context of the lecture and is only conveying the personal experience of one of the lecturers. The content of the slide is not the guidance used to teach coaches how to coach female athletes. It's just an example of a personal experience that one of the instructors had as a lifter and coach during their part of the journey. We acknowledge that if one sees a screenshot without any context, it may be interpreted as being sexist. However, when you consider it in conjunction with the related slides, the context changes because it references a personal story. We reiterate our apologies to our female members and membership as a whole. The uh, intention was never to belittle our female members, but simply to share a personal experience. My God, what a not apology. I can't. They would have been better to just saying nothing or just own up and be like, yeah, you know what? This is, we fucked up here. This is what happened. This is crazy. That's such a non-apology. That's such an apology where it's like, you don't, you might think we did wrong, but you're interpreting wrong. It's actually your fault. If you had more context, you would be, I think this is gaslighting. I think this actually is gaslighting. Is that what the kids say these days? I'm pretty sure this is actually just straight up gaslighting. The, the terms used in that are crazy. Like coaching, coaching female athletes, and coaching male athletes, let's just take powerlifting for a second. The intergroup difference is smaller than the interindividual differences. The change from one lifter of female to another lifter of female, from a male to another male, is just entirely dependent on the person. There, I wouldn't take a broad stroke and say every female athlete has to be coached like this and every male athlete has to be coached like this. Different levels of reassurance are put for different lifters, whether that be male or female. Some lifters need not to reassurance. Some lifters need less reassurance. Some lifters want to be verbally berated. Other lifters just want to be encouraged and positive reinforcement used. But to have a slide like that in the coaching course which is clearly outrageous. And then to tell people that we were at fault for misinterpreting it is absolutely hilarious. And a lot of people are obviously upset in the comments, and rightly so. I, Well, you cannot make that one up. Um, talk about just not admitting you're wrong. <laughs> Holy shit. Okay. Right, let's move on with some lifting. Colton, the limit breaker is here with 435 kilos for two sets of four. Colton has been blowing up some big weights in the last couple of months, and he's been doing it in competition when the time shows up, so it'll be interesting to see what his next competition is. He said, I will be the best deadlifter in powerlifting history. There can be only one, and it will be me. 435 kilos for two sets of four. He's 24 years old. He's had a pretty decent deadlift session. Definitely aren't of the kinks with this one. So yeah, it's a pretty solid deadlift session. I think a lot of us would agree. A couple of sets at 435 kilos is a... It's a pretty routine deadlift session for a lot of us. You know, it's no big deal. So <laughs> it's really interesting to see what Colton is going to end up hitting in a couple of months time if he's moving weights like this he is of course arch nemesis for the sumo deadlift would be jamal browner in terms of powerlifting and colton is a very well rounded lifter across his squat and his bench so he does put up those big totals john hack with his pb of 422 and a half kilos this was the last heavy deadlift of his prep for the competition and he seems pretty happy with this. You can watch actually the full video of this on his YouTube where it was his heaviest gym deadlift ever, 422 and a half kilos. So John is a very good comp lifter 
recently in his most recent comp a couple of months ago he hit a heavy deadlift in training but then hit a heavier deadlift in competition so i'm really hoping or really interested to see what he will end up hitting in competition here he's going to push closer to 427 430 something absolutely gargantuan like that which would be very very interesting to see so we've seen a lot of his lifts from this prep and i'm really interested to see what he's going to hit in this competition because it looks like all of the lifts have gone pretty well he attempted a pb squat but didn't quite make it so be really interested to see what all of these will add up to in this competition because we've been building up for this for a couple of weeks anastasius latifilari look there's only so much i can do with multiple different languages and greek names all right so he's a greek thrower he sent us in and said check out my squad at 310 kilos if you like and i was like who is this i was expecting like a quarter squat or something but he absolutely buries this 310 kilo high bar squat and destroys it in terms of speed so this is once again an example of throwers just at it some of the most ridiculous movers of weights in the gym are always throwers especially when you get to those big squats and moving them at speed is always their forte we always see them lifting those heavy weights but absolutely destroying them in terms of speed they're always just moving them as fast as they can these really heavy weights in throwing because we're such a uni attribute sport or largely pushing one attribute and that's power obviously there's a lot of skill involved in throwing of course across the multiple disciplines but when it comes to power output as long as you're not interfering with your throwing game and your throwing skill and you're not altering your body so much that your technique suffers, there's kind of no upper limit, or at least from what we've seen and if you look at a lot of elite throwers, if you can get those heavier bars moving and getting moving pretty fast, you're giving your better, yourself a better opportunity at your sport. Now, that doesn't guarantee success, but if you can move 310 like this for a full depth squat, you're giving yourself a great chance at throwing as far as possible now here we've got ellis genge and as you know it's very hard for an irish man to report on english rugby but ellis is one of the best players in the world at the moment and as you know the upper body dominant movement you're going to see in the vast majority of elite rugby players is the bench press and this is 180 kilos for a double what's great about rugby players is that they'll always be super neutral back very loose lower bodies frequently very neutral grip and this is a hallmark of that style of bench pressing and you'll routinely see multiple international rugby players most of them once they get above that kind of 100 kilos body weight you'll see a lot of them will be able to bench press 180 and that's kind of almost the minimum standard you're looking for for elite rugby is around that 180 mark now you can start moving more but it does start getting pretty hard to move that needle trying to get north of 200 kilos can be quite rough and it's hard to justify those diminishing returns and the effort it takes to put into training if you look at the length of off seasons if you look at the amount of shoulder injuries in rugby if you come into that off season and then you have oh, you know you might have three or four months but for example we recently had an international rugby player for just six weeks who had a best bench press of around 180 kilos and you such a short length of time where they have this little bit of an off-season to their own thing, which we had that player for a couple of weeks to put them in a great position for showing up well in the off-season. And then if you look at how long you've got to kind of push those numbers, and if you look at, do you need more than 180 kilos? And the answer to that is that probably not. So if you can move 180 kilos like Ellis is moving here, if you're an aspiring rugby player, aspiring international rugby player, you've kind of hit the top hallmark of what we would like to see. You know, look... You know, if you're if you're someone like uh, a 75 kilo player, you're probably not going to be moving 180. In that context, then you're looking at something like double body weight, maybe 150, 160, which should be very doable. But for a lot of the rest of the team, certainly those bigger players, you're going to be looking at that 180 mark, and preferably 180 with a bit of pizzazz, a bit of speed behind it. Roni Shin tags us in this particular video, and he is a pro golf driver. Former D1 golfer, and I think this is the first golfer we've had on the new show. And what a, an opening bout for golfers to put on the new show. So he said he's a professional long driver. We've got a 20 plus mile per hour sprinting in barefoot, which is really interesting. Then a 36 inch plus vertical, 120 kilo power cleans, 120 kilo power cleans. Very technically nice, I might add. Very smooth, most certainly power cleans as well. And then a double body weight back squat. 
And he said, no way you swing under 135 like that. So this is really, really interesting. And we've touched a little bit on pro golfing before in some of our reaction videos. To be honest, we haven't dealt with a whole lot of golfers, which is a, a an interesting sphere because a lot of golfers haven't really been opened up to actual strength conditioning. We've seen a lot of gimmicky strength conditioning. We've had some professional golfers using strength and conditioning, you know, as far back as Tiger Woods. We've several other golfers who've been putting on a bit of mass, some of those younger golfers doing some reasonable strength conditioning. And the outcome on the game is quite interesting, and there's a lot involved in that. Now, it's really interesting because a lot of golfing does actually want to get involved in strength and conditioning, but it's been somewhat bastardized in my opinion not to shit talk a whole industry here but we've seen a lot of golfers being misled with a little bit of all your training needs to be rotational all your training needs to be fixed machine you don't want to get too bulky you don't want to do a lot of upper back work or lower back work in case you get too stiff you want to do lots of really specific golf exercise in the gym which we know just isn't the answer when we're looking at improving attributes so it's really interesting to see a golfer here moving some excellent weights. There's a lot of sports this kind of strength conditioning is super applicable for. And looking at his golf speed in the golf club, I'll show you a video there if you don't want to go look at his Instagram. So we've got 133 miles per hour golf speed here in terms of the club head and 195 for the ball. So this is a March 2021, two years into college golf before he was doing the long drive swing. And now in May 2024, he's hitting 104. 48 miles per hour 148.6 miles per hour and it certainly looks in that time frame he's put on a bit of muscle mass and judging by the training he's doing he's doing some very legit strength conditioning now here we've got the alaskan heritage center which you may remember a few weeks ago from the two foot jump we've got colton again here with the alaskan high kick and this is so cool looking the control in his body here the flexibility the precision the athleticism, his level of gymnastic skills is outrageous here. A, essentially a single arm hang stand and then one leg reaching towards that particular target that they seem to do. Colton looks to be an incredibly athletic young man. We saw him with that two foot high kick before a couple of weeks ago with those just outrageous display of vertical height, flexibility, precision and this Alaskan high kick here is so impressive in terms of total body control athleticism it looks so it looks like something a break dancer would be doing which again fly under the radar for how impressive they are in terms of their athleticism and physical feats and the alaskan high kick seems to be one of the alaskan native games that they play and colton is one that the alaskan heritage center share quite frequently so it's very very impressive here we've got freshman marcellus tate which is on the 24-7 sports reel or Instagram reels. And this kind of reminded me of just, I think it's a great example of just how freakish, of course, American football players can be, but just how important the context of S&C is here in terms of speed, change of direction, taking hits, giving out hits. And you can see the last bit here, just absolutely demolishing that player just before he scores that touchdown. And I was listening to the Coach Him Up podcast with Mike Isbertel. The hosts were talking about S&C here and how that, you know, S&C doesn't change massively between different sports. And when it comes to S&C in a really physical game like American football, Moving certain weights and doing certain things are almost non-negotiables if you really want to push yourself as far as possible. You know, if you're squatting 227 kilos, moving 250 kilos as fast as we've seen some of these players move. You know, we've seen people like Kamari Copeland squatting 275 kilos for a set of 10 incredibly fast. You're giving yourself the best opportunity. But the most important part about that is there's no replacement for that. There's nothing else we can do in the strength conditioning room or in your strength conditioning program that's going to replace heavy fast movements over a full range of motion that we can do safely you cannot get away from someone who's doing 275 kilos for a set of 10 we cannot compare that to any stability exercises any partial range of motion exercises when it comes to building robustness in players and we see a lot ourselves and that's why you see the movements being very similar across sports 
the absolute value you get across those sports changes drastically. Of course, if you're taking a professional golfer, they're not going to be moving 275 kilos like we would see Kamari Copeland, but they're still going to be trying to move some of those weights reasonably fast. You know, We're going to be looking at, can we do one and a half times body weight squat? Can we do two times body weight squat? It's like we were just talking about there with the rugby players. If you're not moving 180 kilos for a lot of those positions, you're putting yourself at a serious disadvantage in terms of that upper body strength. And sports like this, and this particular clip here, just really emphasize this for me. It was a really good opportunity, I think, just to show how important being a unit is. Now, I don't know how much Marcellus Tate can squat or body can move, but I bet you he is pretty strong in the gym. Now, if you'd like to develop your strength, your power, your speed, and your muscle mass in the gym, you may not know about our Becoming a Horse program on the Seek a Strength app on iOS and Android. The Becoming a Horse program is four sessions per week. There's two blocks currently on the iOS and Android app, the Seek a Strength app. This is a program that where we wanted to push some of your speed and power ability, you want to push your strength movements and your hypertrophy or push your muscle mass. So it's a training system that isn't necessarily specific to any sport, but it's a style of training a lot of people want to be doing. There's a little bit of Olympic lifting in it, but you don't need any experience for that to complete the program because we really wanted to make it as general as possible. If you want to build that upper body mass and lower body mass, build your strength and your power. The second block actually has some sprinting. There's lots of jumping in the program and there's some upper body plyometric movements or power style movements in the program as well. So do check that out on the Seek Strength app, iOS and Android. Everyone gets a seven-day free trial.